What are you oh. doing there, Chris? Huh? Oh, nothing. Just this grip. It's perfect. Like, it feels so good for my hand. It's designed like, like, you know when you get a marital aid? It's like anatomically designed off of like your favorite adult entertainment star. Except this camera is anatomically designed for my hand. How do they get a mold of my hand, Jordan? You know, someone else is gonna get that after us, Chris. Oh, they're not gonna want this after I'm done with it. Welcome back, Deep Review TV viewers. Chris Nichols here, and today we're looking at two cameras. We've got the Canon PowerShot G7X Mark III and the Canon PowerShot G5X Mark II. We're looking at both these cameras today because, again, they're very similar at their core, and yet there's some very interesting differences. So think of today's video as a buyer's guide to help you decide which one might be better for you. Now, I know what you're thinking at home. These two cameras are begging for a shootout. Why don't Jordan and I each use one of these and then we can argue with each other and we can spread our relationship business across the whole internet because that's what we love to do. I would love nothing more than to do that, but we couldn't find another cameraman. However, technology is going to help us out here because I am going to show you an amazing technology. It consists of a picture within another picture. I'm gonna call it picture in picture, never been done before, all right? And this means that you're gonna get my opinion when Jordan's talking and Jordan's opinion when I'm talking, totally unfiltered. It's gonna be great, you're gonna love it. Oh, now before I get too excited, let's just try to get through the ergonomics of both these cameras. They do have very similar dial controls, and I do like that on both these cameras. However, I know that first off, Jordan is gonna hate the clickies on these dials, and you can't turn that off and on, something you could have done on the older series. I'm really missing that. However, definitely something that I appreciate, especially over the Sony cameras on the market that are very similar, having a proper exposure comp dial, and it's nice and easy to turn right where your thumb lays. What this means is I can now set minimum shutter speed for my ISO auto, which I love to do, set my camera an aperture priority and control that with the front rings, and then very easily control my exposure with the exposure comp. It's simple, it's straightforward, and I like that on both these cameras. Ooh, but let's talk about the best part, shall we? Now, first off, the G7X Mark III's grip is decent. It's nice, you know, but there's a little bit of wiggle room with your thumb, and, you know, the, the grip on the front is okay. It's not the greatest, but this G5X Mark III grip, it's so good. It's got the slight but subtle perfect angle there in the front that's totally different from the boring and static straight angle here. It just hugs your thumb. Jordan, I'm getting carried away. You need to stop me now. So as usual, Canon has an excellent touchscreen interface. I love the ergonomics. I love the menus. The quick buttons are great. So easy to access. Sony could absolutely take a real lesson from Canon on how to act camera easy and fun to operate. The only thing that I'm gonna argue about, the touch shutter. Honestly, who uses that? Who are these sick, sick people? So you see this gorgeous sunlight that we have through here on the street? It's just reminding me of a feature that I really do appreciate on Canons in this small range, and that is having built-in ND filters. This is huge. Because first off, we do have relatively bright lenses, 1.8 and 2.8. I may want to shoot those on really bright sunny days, and the ND filter can really help out with that. But also, it's nice because keep in mind that if you do have a lot of extra light and you want to get rid of it, on these cameras, diffraction happens so quickly in the aperture range. You really want to avoid any of those tighter or even moderate apertures if you can help it, and an ND filter is great for that. Now, as I mentioned already, both of these cameras have basically the identical tilt vlog style screen on the back. However, the G5X Mark II has something very different. It does have an EVF, one of the main differences between these two cameras. And honestly, it looks a lot like Sony's older design. So similar, in fact, even to the point of having to pull it out with your fingers that 
I don't know. I can't help but feel that it is Sony's technology. 2.36 million dot EVF. I can't confirm that, but man, regardless, it basically operates exactly the same way. Not bad, you know, a little bit small, of course, just like on the old Sony's, but it does keep your nose away from the screen, so you're not going to touch anything inadvertently. And otherwise, I do really love having that feature way better than not having it, especially on bright sun like this, where it's coming right into your face. This has actually been very, very useful. But uh, yeah. Canon's design? I don't know. So let's talk about a tale of two lenses here. The G7X Mark II has the exact same lens that the earlier G5X and G7X had. A very nice 1.8 to 2.8, 24-100 to 100 rough equivalent lens. Very usable for a lot of photography. But the G5X Mark II now actually adds a brand new lens design. 24-120, to 120, but still maintaining the same 1.8 to 2.8 aperture. It is a little bit bulkier, but I think in a lot of cases, that's going to be worth it. I love having that just little extra range. Range. And you can see a nice comparison here between the two at the telephoto range. And when I first looked at both these cameras, I was like, why don't they have the same lens in both? They got a new lens, why not put it in both cameras? But that was the pessimist in me. And you'll have to decide yourself if you're a cup half empty, half full, wherever your cup seems to be. Because the more I think about it, it makes sense. The G7X is a more affordable camera. Put the older lens in there, I get it. Let's just say actually on an optimistic point of view, kudos to Canon for not sticking the same old lens in both cameras. At least we do have a new lens in the G5X Mark II, which helps justify that higher price point. It's interesting too, because the competition right now with the Sony, they're deciding to go with longer lenses, much bigger focal lengths, but not getting the bright aperture. And I think personally they're doing that because they're trying to differentiate themselves from the smartphone market. A longer focal length does provide something that smartphones can't quite touch yet. But I think most photographers are actually going to appreciate the faster, shorter range lenses here. And from what I've seen, the G5X Mark II lens, optically a little bit better than the older lens. So yeah, let's be optimistic. So I can't tell you how many times we rely on USB charging on our cameras because we don't always get chargers with the cameras we're testing and often we need to recharge in the car. It's been a really big deal. And so the Canon actually is kind of a negative point on both here. They do USB-C charge, that is great. However, they won't work with just any charger. Small phone chargers and a lot of car adapters don't seem to be strong enough. You really need quite powerful uh, either battery banks or strong chargers. In fact, Jordan was only able to get his charge with his actual MacBook Pro adapter, which is of course gigantic. So keep that in mind. Of course, they do give you external chargers, but it takes away some of the convenience of just being able to charge anywhere on the go. Now, when it comes to autofocus, unfortunately, this is going to be the G5X and G57X's uh, weakness. And, uh, you know, there's a couple reasons for that. First off, I find the autofocus quite snappy. I think Canon do a fine job. The face detect seems to be working well. It does have eye detect now in continuous. Those are all great features. However, we got to compete against cameras like the RX100 5, 6, and 7 in this range. And the Sony's, although expensive, do absolutely have the best autofocusing on the market, especially the version 7 of the RX100. 100, that camera is the one to beat. So if we talk about one inch sensors on today's market, they're undoubtedly going to be 20 megapixels, no surprise here. However, the Canons now do have stacked CMOS sensors and that's a great thing. But I wonder where those sensors came from. In fact, I wonder where the G5X Mark II's EVF came from. In fact, I'm starting to see a pattern here, aren't I? Now, of course, image quality is still fantastic. The real downside is by using this sensor, we are not getting any sort of hybrid phase detect, contrast detect autofocus. So we are stuck with just standard contrast detect autofocus. And when you're shooting in servo, as you can see here, you're getting the jitters. That's just the way it is. But it does mean that we're not going to get the latest and greatest to compete with everybody else on the market. And by everybody else, of course, I am referring to one company. A long time ago, Chris and I were trying to figure out what frame rates to shoot our show at. And you know, we were shooting at 30 for a while, but then there'd be cameras that could only shoot 24. So we said, you know what, let's just make our entire show 24 frames per second. We can mix and match footage from all kinds of cameras. No one would ever think of taking 24 frames per second away from cameras. Then this happened. Thank you, Canon. So we now have 4K 30 on both the G5X2 and the G7X3. Now it's interesting, it is using no crop whatsoever, but it's not nearly as sharp as the super sampled image that we're seeing off the Sony cameras. The upside to that is very little rolling shutter when you're using these two. 
Now, they do make it a bit difficult for you if you're looking to choose. You might say, G5X, I love having a viewfinder for shooting video. Very valid point. I like having a little more reach. Also very valid. However, the G7X gets the bulk of the sweet video features. On this guy here, we have a microphone jack on it. It's a regular three and a half, so you don't need an adapter. Even though there's no hot shoe to put it on, it'd be great with a little wired lavalier mic or something like that. This also gets the live streaming through Wi-Fi. So hey, DP Review TV viewers, it is Jordan doing a live vlog from the G7X3 straight into Wi-Fi. Now the range on this is pretty bad. I'm actually standing right beside my Wi-Fi router right now uh, because it does keep acting up. Uh, but this is a really cool feature. Uh, it's also really nice because I've got the built-in mic jack on this. So I'm running an external lav right now. However, I can unplug that and you'll be able to hear the sound that we get from the built-in microphone. I mean, it's not great, but it's certainly not that bad compared to some other ones out there. Now, I do certainly wish that the G5X2 had this capability. Seems crazy that they both have Wi-Fi and only the G7X3 can do it. However, if you are the kind of person who does live video occasionally, this might be the feature that makes this the camera to buy. Uh, I'm hand holding it right now. The image is quite nice on it. I like that I get full manual exposure. It is a really sweet setup. Now, I wanna mention as well, this took me forever to set up. I've spent the better part of a day trying to get this all working, and when you have an error message, it's very vague as to exactly why things aren't working. But once you jump through all the hoops, don't plan to buy this camera and be live vlogging on the day, then you can get some pretty cool results, and it is pretty intuitive once it's all up and running. Now, one thing I do love, both of these have built-in ND filters on them. They also gain 120 frame per second slow-mo. Now, it's not the sharpest, but it's a great thing to have. The thing that's really weird for me when I'm talking about Canon cameras is one of the weakest things on this is actually the autofocus. This does not get the dual pixel autofocus that we see on Canon's DSLR and mirrorless cameras. So the video autofocus, especially if you're on the long end and you've got a subject moving towards you, it is quite wobbly and weird. You might have heard some complaints with Panasonic using a similar system. Okay, so final conclusion on which way to go, G7X or G5X. I really do think that the G7X Mark III is a fun camera. I, I would go that way if I wanted to save a bit of money absolutely I would also go that way if I really want to do a lot of vlogging and the live stream thing is a very cool unique feature that not many other cameras you're gonna find on the market are even gonna to try to implement so that could be a big selling feature but otherwise as a photographer I really did prefer the G5X Mark II in pretty much every way shape and form I do like the new lens it's a little bit more range but it's still bright and you're not really losing much pocketability regardless when talking about these two Canon cameras here's a couple things that are true to me first off I don't think anybody else in the market is making as fun or as intuitive a camera to use as the Canon power shots in this one inch compact class. But the other thing that's true to me is that these absolutely compete with a lot of the older RX100s. But again, that means that you're not really getting the latest and greatest. King of the one inch compacts is gonna be the RX107. The autofocus is way better, better video. I mean, it just has better technology. However, it is way more expensive and that does have to be appreciated. And that big price disparity brings me to the only thing that I think I would really change on the G5X Mark II. Because we have such a big price difference, I feel we could raise the price a little bit higher on this camera, but then get in a lot of the same features as we have on the G7X Mark III. Why do we have to pick between the two? Why doesn't this have a mic jack as well as the G7X Mark III? This could easily also have that live streaming capability, and then that would make this a very compelling and very unique camera on the market that's still well below what Sony is featuring as their flagship one-inch compact. Anyways, both great cameras. I really do like the new lens here. They handle fantastic. Ooh, and the grip. Oh, the grip. Anyways, enough about that. I hope you guys enjoyed this and it helps you out in deciding which one might be better for you or which way to go in the one-inch compact mirrorless market. Now, please don't forget, subscribe to the channel, check out our Instagram and our Twitter pages. Let us know what you think in the comments below and go to dpreview.com because you can see some awesome sample galleries of both these cameras to help you make your decisions even more sound. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, hopefully one day we'll get Jordan and I together in a shootout very soon. Ugh, stop it.